you know, that are given to us uh, in that setting. They cannot be replaced. All right. So but there will be deficits. So let's say if this goes on for the many months to come, there are going to be deficits. Yeah. Uh, we will be missing things and we will be, there will be uh, sub substantial losses. Uh, however good it is, however, we're enjoying the benefits of uh, meeting over computers and electronics. Uh, so we're longing for that day. Amen. All right, so we should long for that. So the very fact that we long for that, uh, uh, like I long to see the Ugandan brothers or the Sri Lankan brothers and sisters or Sud and Buggy in Mongolia. The very fact that we long for that tells you that that's the witness and uh, the testimony of the life of God in us. All right, and we should. And that in itself is a sign and the, and the pulsation um, and the beating of that eternal life in us. We long for that, we long for face-to-face, -face, uh, for the addition, for the increase. And, uh, so they are increased, they are increased uh, in life, there is increase in, in, in matters, in increase in spiritual reality, there is increase in spiritual life uh, that comes with a face-to-face, communion, face-to-face -face fellowship. All right, uh, praise God. Uh, is there anyone here that has something to share uh, before we go any further? Is there anything, anyone? With, uh, with anything in your heart that you want to share with us? Uh, so I'm saying, I'm saying like right on top of your heart, <laughs> something that you want to share with us about. Uh, well, uh, I do, but I would, uh, I would like to wait until the end of the meeting and I would like to do it when we're not recording. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. All right. Sure, Eric. Any, besides that, is there anyone with uh, something to talk about, something to share? We missed Stephen last Sunday, so maybe Stephen has something bottled up in his heart. <laughs> yeah, we were wishing uh, Stephen and Peggy uh, the anniversary. So apparently uh, they celebrated their 31st anniversary, what, yesterday? Okay. It doesn't look like he has been married for 31 years, is it? Huh? <laughs> so even I was surprised that they had been married for 31 years. I thought it was shorter than that. That's great, my brother. Thankful for, for Stephen and Peggy and the family. I, I was, I was, I was um, sharing with my friends, uh, one of my uh, cell group member, just jokingly telling him that, you know, yeah, 31 years, you don't believe, look at the, look at the, the scars and the marks on my back, you know. <laughs> yeah, but, but what I was trying to say to him was like, you know, um, yeah, the Lord has kept us both and uh, we are thankful. And um, yeah, it's through this, uh, um, relationship as husband and wife, you know, uh, so many things have been um, exposed or uh, brought to surface and, um, and uh, thank the Lord for, for confronting, uh, confronting us and not um, letting us go, uh, though it is, though very often it is very difficult, you know, that's why the, the scars and the marks and, the, and all those things and, and, um, and we, we are we are very thankful because um it all happens in a in a family whereby uh there's nothing really you, you can't hide it right so um your your children they 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 notice it they see it and i think that's what makes um the faith very real to them and um yeah mm -hmm. so it's uh, it's one blessing unto 
a person being blessed and then you know it, it ripples to to others also especially uh, the children so uh, yeah we are very thankful it's very exciting yeah yeah i remember actually uh one of the things that i recall was that when i first met Stephen and Peggy Usually, you always kind of like gauge how long you've known someone. Uh, one of the first uh, place to measure is always the children that they have. So I remember that I, you know, I saw uh, Gloria and Emmanuel when they were so young. So that's how long ago. Now, now they're all grown up in their twenties, and so it's like you know when I first met Prabhashini, you know, youngest boy, you know, uh, you know. Adin was only a small little boy, you know, with just barely learning how to walk. And now Adin is, you know, eight, nine, is it nine years old? Ten, yeah, there you are. So that's how long ago. So you always kind of remember that. Uh, so that's how long ago that I, I knew Stephen and Peggy. Yeah. So I suppose the scars that you were talking about, they're not physical scars, by the way, just in case some of you would be thinking that Peggy had been, beat, <laughs> had been beating him up or something like that. And, uh, and strangling him or something like that. No, it's like, not only me that has scars, she also got scars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> she probably has got more scars, though, Stephen. <laughs> that is the dream he boxed me, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, all right. Yeah, so it's uh, well, we do we do thank the Lord that uh, when uh, uh, Christian marriage uh, can testify of the workings of the Lord in their relationships, it's always a joy to hear. And uh, and uh, the flip side is uh, just as we we're talking about this, you know, Adrian had a colleague who the Christian. You know, we had a Christian colleague who we just found out that uh, in the process of, uh, of divorce, you know, I'm a Christian, and uh, they come from educated background, and uh, apparently I think the husband is a doctor, and they're in the process of, uh, of divorce, and uh, young, young couple, uh, so with no children. So that's what I'm saying, that, uh, but when you hear those that, have lasted, that have uh, the years that have added on in their lives and their marriage, of which uh, they have seen the workings of the Lord and entered into their marriage. Uh, and they have kind of persevered and God in his grace has kept them together as husband and wife and as a family. It's always something to rejoice in. So we're thankful for that. All right. Uh, and the reason why uh, I'm kind of like slow to share with you here today is because uh, I suppose uh, it has it has to do with uh, the word that was shared last Sunday uh, and the content and the nature in which the word was shared. And I think uh, for me, it is still resonating. And uh, so, the times like this has given me uh, uh, lots of time to read and uh, lots of time to, to consider so many issues, uh, issues in which I share with you that uh, I'm longing to be with you in person, uh, face to face, either you know, as a church or even as I am in your presence in your country. And, uh, and or the, the conference that we will be holding in the days to come for you to be amongst us. So, and this is what I'm longing for. All right. Uh, and that's what, that's what the church was meant to be. That's what the ministry uh, of the word was meant to be. All right. And so it's a ripple of life. It's the ripple of God. The nature of God's eternal life in us is likened to a river. All right. It begins in Genesis and it ends uh, in the book of the Revelation in chapter 22. And there is that proceed from the throne and from the land. 
that river of life clear as crystal. So that that life, that river of life runs, you know, from the beginning to the end. Uh, he is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. The entire consummation of the age uh, hangs in the balance within that river and how we are to find our place in that river, how we are going to find ourselves uh, in that river, what we become, what we will be, and what God redemptively uh, intended us to be uh, is at the very center of it in that river. And that's why you notice at the end of the book of the Revelation, uh, when, a, when John was in a vision, saw and heard, and what he actually heard was that uh, the angel so very much telling him, he who thirsts right to the end in Revelation 21, uh, uh, 21, I think, if I'm not mistaken, he who thirsts. So right at the very end of it, and God is as if that uh, this is still the witness that is unending, unceasing. Um, so the sign of life, the sign that there is the throbbing, and there is the livingness, and there is the pulsation, there is the dynamics of that life in a man or in a woman is measured by thirst, like our physical life. Your health is measured by how much you thirst every day. And that, of course, includes hunger, too. And uh, the state of your heart, you, the state of your life, the state of your physical life, your, your biological life is how much you're drinking, how much you're eating, how well you're drinking, and how well you're eating, your consumption, your drink, water. They say that uh, you, can, you can survive without food for many days, but... You're not going to live without water uh, anything more than three days. And your body starts to shut down. Your organs starts to fail. And everything in you starts to fall apart when there is a lack of uh, fluid and the water. So first, even to the end, uh, God would measure us, uh, the state of our life, the state of our existence, and everything that we are before him in our relationship by how much you are thirsting. So everything has to do uh, with that dribble of life. All right? And, then, and we, we're not supposed to drink alone. And that's what makes the church so unique. Uh, I can be thirsty every day. I can be thirsty every week and every month spiritually. But I can't just drink alone. I need to drink with others. I need to be in the togetherness of others. There's something of the whole dynamics of uh, we share our drinking together. We live in that drink together. We talk about that drink together. We expand that drink together. We converse about that drink together. So there is a, there is a mystery about that drinking. In fact, uh, you will probably know even more about the drink only when you drink with others. You know, there's a, there's a saying that goes that, you know, you can, uh, you can cook the best dish and all the dishes you want, but you, you're not going to cook them all and put them before your table and eat it all by yourself. There's no fun in it. There's no joy in it, isn't it? If you're cooking, if you are such a great cook or great chef, you, know, you want to share it with your friends, your neighbors, with people around you. In fact, it is the other way around. Uh, you, know, you, you, you know those people who, who are so good in cooking or they are expert in the cooking, their joy is not just so much in the cooking. Of course, they do. The, the greater joy in after finishing their cooking is to watch others enjoying, uh, you know, the skills, enjoying the food in which they have labored, you know, for hours in the kitchen. And so there's there's a whole dynamics of that internal life in us, and uh, so that's what I meant when I said earlier that. We we're meant to be face to face, and this is at the at the heart of it all. It all has to do with uh, the drink, and uh, so if you are drinking, if you are drinking as you should spiritually, this is what you miss. This is what you long for. This is what you're pining. This is what you're groaning about, and it should even be a place in your heart where 
the longing turns into a travail and into an uh, into a sense uh, of groaning in your heart, Lord. Hasten the day that we can drink together. All right, and uh, and, and that's why uh, that's the nature of the spirit. All right, that's the nature of the spirit of God. He has come uh, to to engendle that appetite and that drink in us. He that he that uh, hunger and thirst, as Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, he shall be filled. All right. So God creates the thirst in you. God puts the thirst in you. The life of God is a life that thirsts after God. Only God can thirst after God. Only God in you longs after God. All right. And that's why that longing and that thirst and that drinking is a spiritual capacity. It's a spiritual, is a spiritual dynamic, is a spiritual reality. How do you know someone has the life of God in him? There's a thirst. There's a thirst that cannot be quenched. There's a thirst that never ceases. There's a thirst that uh, that goes on and on. It's a thirst. In fact, this thirst is so powerful that you know the more you drink, the more you want to drink. In fact, the more you drink, the more you're not satisfied. You see that? There's an eternal appetite. There's an eternal capacity. There's an eternal depth. The more you drink, uh, the deeper you want to drink. You're not just you're not just having the surface. You're not just having things uh, on the surface. The more you drink, the deeper it is. And uh, so it's strange. You want to drink as deep as you want to drink. Any more that you want to drink as high as you want to. All right. So. These are spiritual language and uh, that God gave to these men, these apostles. You know. That's why Jesus said that out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. Uh, so that has been the example. Uh, so it was, it was because of what was shared on Sunday that uh, I'm kind of like, you know, if given, you know, the fellowship that we can be together on a face-to-face -face basis, and I'll be kind of waiting on you <laughs> for your response and uh, for something to resonate from your heart, uh, you know, uh, so that uh, the preacher is not the only one that drinks. Okay? Uh, so any more than in the family of God, you don't just want the father who is sitting in the family over a meal be the only one to drink. How about, you know, the members of the family? And uh, do they drink too? He's not going to just sit there watching and, you know, gubbing all of the water. And uh, and everyone is left, you know, without a cup. Everyone is left without, you know, uh, the desire to drink. And so there is a collective drinking that goes on. And so the Lord desires that uh, for all of us. I mean, so that's what I meant when I said that you know, I was longing to kind of wait on you to see uh, what has come out of that uh, of that work. Uh, so how important that is, All right? <laughs> and, uh, so I remember some years ago, or at least about ten or years ago, when uh, we were together. You know, in Minnesota, uh, in the fellowship where art was, and uh, I remembered that uh, uh, just before Sabbath, and I was just before Sunday morning. Uh, so there was no designation. Of course, we all kind of understood that, you know, art being the leader of the community and the art, the leader of the fellowship, that he's going to share the word. <laughs> and uh, and I, I remember that. Uh, you know, was it was it a Friday? Because they do a Friday uh, Shabbat, uh, Shabbat uh, meal together. So I think uh, he walked over while we were eating. He walked over and kind of like uh, you know highlighted to me. So what's what's Lord's work this uh, this Sunday? You know, now isn't that that I was told that I'm going to preach on Sunday or share on Sunday? You know, we were all visitors. Myself and my whole family were there. 
and he asked me, so, so what's the Lord's word uh, on Sunday? And uh, I, I kind of, uh, I, don't, I don't exactly remember how I answered it, but I answered it some, like, like, uh, like something like, uh, I don't know yet, uh, I, I'm, uh, because I was caught off surprise. I wasn't told that I'm, I'm, I was supposed to share on Sunday. Uh, so I was kind of a call off surprise. And so in that very unprepared state of mind, uh, anymore, it was an unprepared state of heart. I just kind of said, well, I don't know. Uh, well, I will see or something like that, you know, along, along that line. And uh, I almost, I almost at that very moment got a gentle rebuke. <laughs> uh, gentle rebuke simply means, what? You don't know? <laughs> you don't know what you're going to say? What, uh, you don't know what's already in your heart? So it kind of it startled me at that moment, uh, and the reason being is because uh, he wasn't he wasn't chiding me. What he actually was, what he actually meant, and I knew what he meant. He didn't say it, but what was not even spoken was 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 so you know was so powerfully communicated that yeah, you're supposed to be in the river. That's what he actually meant. All right, of course he didn't say it, but what I'm trying now to tell you. 10 years later, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm kind of reminding you of an incident for my own life is that the servant of the Lord, as much as I myself was a servant of the Lord, I was a preacher, you're supposed to know, you're supposed to live in that river, you're supposed to be always ready, you're always, you're supposed to be uh, always in the place where you are in the drink, where you are in the water of life, you're soaked. In that water, that water is unconsciously flowing within you. So it wasn't so much that whether I had a word or not for Sunday, it was it was that the way in which I should have replied, or I should have uh, be able to uh, to communicate at that very point in time, the readiness, the preparedness, the state of my life. Uh, I suppose now, 10 years later, if I'm asked the same question again, is there a word on Sunday? I, my reply would have been, I know that the Lord shall present. I know that the Lord shall give. And I will be there to deliver it as and when the Lord will so choose it. You see that? So again, you see, it took 10 years for you you know, to grow into that, to understand that, that, and we are to live like that. And by the way, saints, we're supposed to live like that. All right, preacher or not a preacher, pastor or not a pastor, we're supposed to live like that because there will be moments in your life. Your life isn't just going to be wait on a Sunday so that a word can come forth. What if you are in a moment? Where, what if you are in a circumstance when a word is required for another person? Or when you are in a situation, when you are in a crisis, or when you are in trouble, or when you are in a circumstance, or when you are in a situation with your wife, with your children, with your loved ones, with your friends, with your neighbor, and a word of wisdom is required, a word of understanding, a word of knowledge, a knowledge of the Lord has to be exhibited. Something of the wisdom of God has to be brought forth, an understanding of something of some kind has to be brought into a situation. The word sees every other situation, but there is an understanding which the Lord would give to us in that situation. That is none of this word. A thousand and one people can be seeing that situation with a thousand and one worldly views, and the views of the word, the, we, the views of all these men and women who are just talking heads, but there is a view that comes from God. Are we there to present that hope? Are we there to be the explicator? Are we there to be the explainer, the interpreter of God's mind for that? And unless we have stayed in a place where we are constantly in that dream, we are in that dream. We're constantly in that river. We don't get in, we don't get out, we don't jump in, we don't jump out, we live in that river. Everything about us is that river. Right? And uh, so 
Anything that is in that river, it's a river that flows, it's a river that is spontaneous, it's a river that is living. So the word that comes to mind immediately about a river is the spontaneity, the spontaneous. All right, there's no stagnancy about that river. Jesus never found himself ministering around any, any vicinity in the Dead Sea. Can you imagine? He's constantly in the Sea of Galilee. Look at your geography. Look at your map at the back of your Bible. It's not that kind of uh, too long a distance between uh, the Dead Sea and the Sea of Galilee. But he's constantly in the Sea of Galilee. There's something about the Sea of Galilee because there is an inflow and an outflow of the Sea of Galilee. That's what makes the Sea, what, that's what makes the sea of Galilee uh, a place, a center of activities, of fishers, of, of fishermen. So much of Jesus' activity was found around and within the Sea of Galilee. He called, these, he called all these 12 disciples who in the end became apostles from there. Most of them from the Sea of Galilee, some of his miracles, some of his saying, some of his word came from the shores of Galilee. Some of his encounter, some of his miracles came from the Sea of Galilee. So, so he speaks of the whole spontaneity. And uh, we're supposed to live like that. All right, regardless of whether, you know, we are called to be preachers and that, you know, we need to be all kind of set in our heads and our minds and prepared for work on Sunday. So that was what Art meant when he says, so what's the, what's the word of the Lord this Sunday? So I think he wasn't kind of waiting for me to give a particular word or a particular title or a particular word of a burden, but that I would, I would, I would should have been, you know, the person, the brother, the preacher, who is able to say that, you know, the word is already in my heart, waiting for expression, waiting to be delivered, waiting for its outcome, waiting for it to issue uh, from my heart. See that? And that should be my, that should have been my response. I would have responded now, of course, but not then. And so, so whatever that sometimes in so much of our inadequacy and uh, we need to understand that uh, so if the Bible begins with that river and closes with that river, then everything is going to be determined within this river. Our entire life will be measured, prepared, tested by how much we find ourselves in this river. Okay, and we need to understand that. And no one, no one now, as we watch at one another. No one, whether our wives and husbands or our children who are beside us, no one can drain that water on our behalf. I don't care how much you love your wife or your husbands and your sons and your daughters and your loved ones. You can never drain that water on behalf of someone. You can love your wife to death. You can't drain that river on behalf of your wife. You can love your husbands all you want. You can't drink it on her behalf. None of us, we're called to drain our private and our personal river. Because that is the nature of eternal life. God has to give to us our personal cup. My cup runneth over. Your cup. The cup of salvation. Uh, so you, can, you have to drink this. And because and how we drink that cup has everything to do with those around you, how they will drink too. <laughs> All right. And uh, so it's important. That we understand that uh, this this is how uh, God intends it to be. So it's important, and uh, so He looks at our personal river. He looks at the state of uh, the health of our drinking. And uh, can you can you imagine how how much of a rejoicing that must be? when there is a corporate drinking. Just imagine that. All right? How wonderful that will be when there is a corporate drinking when we are together. Uh, if, God, if God were to enjoy the very fact that there is a personal drinking from, from an individual, from a person, a person to a, 
a person, uh, a person of relationship with the Lord, how much more when the when God sees His people, a drinking people gathered together, you know, that makes that makes that thirst, that makes that whole drinking, uh, the sharing uh, of that water of life, you know, with such capacity, all right, with such gulp, with such intake, with such inflow. I suppose that's the reason why sometimes when we get together, as in uh, uh, person to person, why do you think that we sense uh, the Lord's presence and the Lord's giving and the energy and the power and the volume and the capacity of the desire more uh, is so in, it's so incremental. It's because the Lord watches this. All right. Uh, that's why it's likened to the Psalms that says uh, uh, that says how wonderful it is for brethren to dwell together. And what's the immediate example that the Psalmist uses? He uses the whole consecration of the priests, Aaron the priest, the consecration of the priests, how sacred that is. The consecration of the priests was the giving of the priesthood to the nation of Israel. And that was used as an example that when the fellowship, when the, when the coming together of God's people has such a dynamic and has such a content and has such an atmosphere and is being identified by the Lord, and how can that be identified? It's not because, you know, we're, it's not because of our race. It's not because, you know, we all like coffee together. And it's not because we like a certain food together. So that makes us very distinct. I believe that it has to do with our spiritual appetite. And so when God sees, you know, a thirsty collective group of people together, he, like, he, write, he, he likened that as a collective priesthood of which he can pour himself. That's what the priest was. The priests were men and women who was there to receive from God because they were to be there as mediator to bless the nation. Of course, in this case, to bless the nation of Israel as, as Aaron and his sons were. So the immediate example that was used was actually the priesthood. And how precious it is, is when brethren dwell together in unity. They are likened as the anointing oil that flows from the head to the beard and to the garment of the priest. And then the second example was, is that the dew. He says, likened like the dew of Hermon that falls on Mount Zion. Can you imagine? All right. So again... Those, those are the lovely pictures. Those are the, the precious, precious example, precious pictures presented to us uh, of our life, of the state of where we're supposed to be spiritually. Uh, so, <clears throat> so the health of our spiritual life in, is, in, uh, is in the sign of our thirst. All right, it's in the sign of our thirst, and it's also in the sign of our hunger. How thirsty are we? So, if if you have not been thirsty, there have been no desire to drink, and uh, <clears throat> there's no deepening desire. Some people seem to ask this question: Is it? I don't know why is it that uh, I have desire, but it's not going any further. Well, something is wrong with the intensity of that desire. All right, and so it begins every time when there is a desire to drink. It begins by you having to drink, and as you begin to drink, and that's that's exactly what the Lord intends to do. How does that desire increase? Is by drinking, and as you drink, the desire to drink increases, and as you bring more, the desire to drink more increases, and as you bring deep, the desire for deep things begin to increase. So it all begins with a drink. And it is not some self thing. It's not some human and gentle and human ability. It is what that eternal life is. Jesus promised that woman. He said that if you knew of the water that I will give to you, he says that, that then you would know who's to, who, who is talking to you. The water that you drink, you go home, you still be thirsty. But the water that I give to you to drink, he said it shall be in you. And it shall spring forth into life eternal. That's the nature of eternal life. Okay. 
So drinking is everything. Eating is everything. All right. And that's the sad thing today in the days that we're living in. So we've lost the art of drinking. It's being replaced by so many other things. It's by how much I do, how much I build, how much, you know, I, I work and how much, you know, I can get myself busy. So a lot of these equations has become very faulty, very erroneous. How much I serve equals how much I drink. It's not true. You can serve and serve and never drink. Never drink. How much I have been serving, you can serve and serve and never even drink a single cup all your, all your days. How much I preach, and just because you preach, just because you're a servant, just because you're a preacher, just because you're a pastor, just because you're a Sunday school teacher. So therefore, how active I am equals how much I'm drinking. That's not true. All right. So, so this, is, this is where the subtlety is. This is where the error has entered into many lives. So we have not, we have not drink. And uh, it is in that drinking that everything about us begins to reflect that drinking. The health of our spiritual life, the content of our spiritual life, the state of our spiritual life, everything and how we look like comes up that drinking. Like they say, isn't it? You become what you eat. You also become what you drink. We become what we eat, we become what we drink. And it's because we don't drink enough or, we, or because we have not drunk as the way we should be drinking. Can you imagine? What do you think we're giving? What do you think we're saying? What do you think that we're preaching? What do you think that we are giving to others? If it's not from the drinking. So I think Oswald Chamber has got this uh, of this has this description that says that ministry is the overflow of our personal cup. If ever, if ever there is a ministry in our life, it's only because there is an overflow. In other words, you have been drinking and drinking to the point that you're overflowing. You don't even know you're overflowing. And what is that overflow from your life becomes the ministry. The sad thing is today, when we don't overflow, in other words, there's something wrong with our drinking. We don't overflow, and yet we are, we are serving and we are giving. So my, my, the point is this. So if you are serving, if you are giving, then what are you giving? So the premise of your giving is not coming from an overflow. So if you are not giving an overflow, so what you're doing is, what are you doing? You're doing the same thing that the woman is doing. At the well, so you're bringing your buckets and you're trying to drop buckets, you know, wherever you can drop your buckets to fetch water. And that's exactly what so many have been doing. We're dropping buckets in the hope that we can, you know, fetch buckets of water here and there and all over the place in, in the hope that you can give to people. And only to find that the more you're going to draw this bu bucket, the more empty we will be, the more thirsty we will be. So if you are thirsty, if you are in that kind of a state, can you imagine what comes out of you? You're just dropping buckets all over the place. And sometimes when the bucket do come out and you do give it out, half the time it's not even pure. Well, because you dropped the bucket, it would have collected dirt, it would have collected mud. And when you pour this out, it's the dirt, it's the dirt and the mud that is being given out. And this is exactly what we're seeing. I'm using this example to illustrate. Because the lack of the overflow, they say that, you know, if you, if you, if you stay in the place of overflow, how many of you know that overflow means there is a cycle of water? And when there's always a cycle of water, it's strange, isn't it? When, when water keeps overflowing, whatever the impurity is going to come out and to a point that there is no more impurity because the overflow becomes so pure. The overflow is, is where you see the pureness of the water. You can see the, dis, uh, the distinction. You can see the crystal clearness. You can see all of, its, uh, of the health of that water, all the purity of the water. It's because it lives in the place of the overflow. So it's only in the place of the overflow 
that true ministry begins. And that's why we are to, we are to look after our drinking. Our ministry, our true ministry is drinking. Our true ministry unto God and unto one another is in the place of drinking. And until we drink, there's nothing to give. Until we drink uh, to the point that there is already an overflow, that nothing comes out of our lives is going to be of any use or any blessing to those around us. So he blesses the overflow. He watches the overflow. And this is where our lives is. All right, saints. All right. So that leads me to basically want to read something out to you. I actually meant to read it out, but uh, it kind of uh, slipped in the last couple of weeks uh, we have been together. And I meant to actually share with you in the like of what was shared on Sunday, uh, a thought that uh, came across in my reading with Oslo Chambers. So I have Adriel to actually put it up. Uh, it has something to do with what I just shared, what I've been speaking in the last 10, 20 minutes. The entry is in my utmost for his eyes, and Abel will put it up for us. It's on the 7th of August. It's on screen, and uh, so we can all kind of look at it together. And uh, if, so if Abel can put it up uh, as in the page before, uh, some of you, you don't have to turn on your, uh, if you have an Oswald Chambers, of course, uh, just by your side, you know, in front of you or with your Bibles, you can turn to it. The entry is on, it's actually on the 7th of, uh, of this month. Indeed, no, sorry. Sorry? I'm sharing my screen. Can, can we all see it now? Yeah, I can. Okay. Yeah, we can. All right, so... That's uh, Adriel is putting this up for us. Uh, so the the scripture reference there is, of course, Luke two forty nine. Jesus answering those that says, uh, "Which which not that I must be, or that I must be in my father's house." All right, so. I'm going to just read this out. So follow me if you are following, because, because what I actually want is the closing part of this entry. Okay. And uh, so let me kind of read it out to you. And as you follow it on screen that, so Chambers here says that our Lord's childhood was not immature manhood. Our Lord's childhood is an eternal fact. Am I a holy, innocent child of God by, by identification with my Lord and Savior? Do I look upon life as being in my father's house? Is the son of God living in his father's house in me? So it's very interesting that uh, Chambers interpret this so accurately. So the question asks is, do I look upon life as being in my father's house? So what he's actually saying is, the second question is, is the son of God living in his father's house in me? So we are to be the indwelling of Jesus in our lives causes Jesus to make us to be the father's house. And Jesus is always interested in the state of the father's house. And he lives in the father's house. And we are that house. All right. So the life of the son of God. Jesus himself who lives in us. Turn our lives into the father's house. It's very important. So then you begin to understand. 
how important it is that Jesus' business is what is happening to his father's house. So the second passage here is the abiding reality is God. And his order comes through the moment. Am I always in contact with reality? Or do I only pray when things have gone wrong? When there is a disturbance in the moments of my life? I have to learn to identify myself with my Lord in holy communion in ways some of us have not began to learn as yet. I must be about my father's business. Live the moment in my father's house. Narrow it down to your individual circumstances. Are you so identified with the Lord's line that you are simply a child of God, continually talking to him and realizing that all things come from his hands? Is the eternal child in you living in the father's house? Is the eternal child, Jesus, of course, living? Is that eternal child in you living in the Father's house? Question mark. Are the graces of his ministering life working out through you in your home? That's what I meant when I said that we are to be constantly in the place of drink, where that eternal life is the drink of our life. So that's how he puts it here. Is the graces of his ministering life working out through you in your home, in your business, in your domestic circle? Have you been wondering why? Now, this is what I want you to pay attention. All right. And in your own spare time, you can read uh, this devotion again. But I want you to concentrate on this, on this last few lines here. Have you been wondering why you are going through the things you are? Question mark. It is not that you, you notice that the word you, all right, is in italics. All right, can you see that? Have you been wondering why you're going through what, you, through the things that you're going through? Is not you. So, in my devotion, there the word you there here, highlighted by Adro, is in italics. So Chamber says, it is not you. It is not that you have to go through them. It is because of the relation into which the Son of God has come in his Father's providence in your particular same group. So it's not so much about you. Whatever that you have to go through, it's, it's not you that God is really, that you and I seem to think sometimes, Lord, why me? Lord, why am I going through this and that and the other? So what Chamber is saying is that it is not you that have to go through them. It is because of the relation into which the Son of God has come in his Father's providence in your particular sainthood. So what Chamber is actually saying, it's not so much of you, it is what? It is what the Father is desiring Jesus to become in you. It is what the Father desire for Jesus to become in you. It is the becoming. It is the state. It is the nature. It is the content. It is, it is the amount, if I can use that word, all right? It is the quality. It is the quality of the life of Jesus in us. And the father watches the quality of the life of his son in us. That's why it is the father's house. That's why when the father sees us he sees that we are that house and he, and there is someone that he is very concerned that lives in that house and it's the life of his own son it's not about just you it's not you per se that god is after yeah 
it's you, of course. It is your home, your your situation, your marriage, your children, your business, your affair, whatever that may be. But God is after someone. He's after the very thing. He's after the very life of his son. He has turned you. He has used you. He has employed you to be his house in which he has put his son to live in. So whatever that he is after, so, so to speak, in your circumstance, isn't just about you, but it has to do with the relation into which the Son of God has come in his Father's providence in your particular sainthood. So there is something about God having to use your circumstance, to use you, you in whatever that you are in, in your setting in your home in your marriage in your workplace in your business in your relationship with people with things around you that god would use that for what purpose in his in his sum of all of his providences he wants to use it for what for the growth of his own son for the whole maturing of his own son because the father has his eyes on his own house. The father's business is his house. His house is his business. And who is it that is living in that house? His own son in you. And you are that house. So, and this is where, listen, it's so important. And if you don't understand this, and this is where it creates a lot of problems, and it has created a lot of problems. Why? Because if you don't see this, then the attention is always on yourself. How you want to get out of that situation, how you want your situation to improve, and how you want this to get better. How it is all about your comfort. It's how about your stability. It's all about what you want. It's about how you are in, in a place of distress and how you're so uncomfortable with this and so on and so forth. So everything is all centered about you. But if you, if you don't see that, if you don't see that this is the overriding reality, and that's why Chamber uses the word here, the abiding reality. If this is not your abiding reality, if something else is, then this won't make sense to you. This will not make sense to you. What we just read here, what Chamber is describing here will never make sense to you if that reality, that central abiding reality is not at the very center of your existence. Because if that is, if that do, if that reality is beating behind your chest right now, you will immediately understand what he's saying. And that's what I meant. When I said that uh, you will understand this because you have really been a drinker. <laughs> Sorry for using the word. You've really been drinking. You have really been drinking from the very fountain and from the very depths of what God is doing in you. You have been drinking. And that's why there is that reality in you that makes you so conscious of what the Father desires. So you, you interpret everything in your life as indeed to be at the very center of God's house. God, if this is what brings glory to you, if this is what will allow your son to increase in me, if this is what will allow your son to thrive in me, to expand in me, to grow in me, to, to, to increase in me, and, uh, and to... Uh, and to take shape within me, Lord, by all means. Help yourself. Help yourself to everything that is in me. Help yourself to my life. Do what you want. Do what you want as long. In fact, do what you want to the point that let nothing inside me hinder what you want from this house. Because if, it, if I am your house and all you care about is how your son live in your house, 
then why should you care about me? Why should you care about the Lord? You're going to be that you have to listen to what I tell you, Lord. Be careful now. Don't disturb me here. Don't disturb me there. Don't take this away from me. Don't take that away from me, Lord. How about me? How about this? Lord, don't listen to my complaint. All I care about is what well, Jesus and what you want in your son, in me. And if we can understand that, And if we can comprehend that, saints, that is going to bring us to a place of true rest. This is going to bring us to a place of true joy and true rest. And this is where, as I said a while ago, this is what caused you to be a drinker. This is what caused you to partake in that eternal life, in that river that never ceases, that never stops flowing. And you begin to drink. And you begin to enjoy the Lord's presence and the Lord's way with your life. And that, that's why your mind is set free from all about yourself. And you begin to understand the ways of the Lord in your life. And the reason why so many of us have got ourselves kind of muddled. You know, muddled means, you know, we, we got ourselves all messed up. And our head is all because, you see, we're so drowned with our own self-consciousness. It's all about ourselves. It's not. It's not about you. If you can understand that, what he's after is that he's after his own house in you. He's after his own house, and there's only one person he cares the most in his house. It's not so much you. It's actually what the son becomes in you. In fact, it is only when the son truly is what he is in the house that you find your place, that you truly come into your rest, your stability. That's where you come into your healing, your reconciliation. It's only when the son has that preeminence in you that you finally understand who you are. You begin to, you begin to discover your wholeness, your healing, your reconciling, your maturity. See that? See how important that is? It's only when the father's business, when his house is in that kind of a state. When his house is kept in that state of pristine glory, in that brilliance, when finally he sees his son having such a place in that house, you will fall into place. Problem is today, we're in the throne that is in the house. We want to be in the, on the throne in that house and not the son. And that's where the problem is. And that's why Jesus becomes our servant. Jesus becomes our little mate we order around. Jesus becomes a formula. Jesus becomes a method. Jesus becomes something that we can use. Jesus becomes some kind of a therapy for us to become better, to become good, to become more this and more that. We've got a better husband, a better son, a better daughter a better preacher, a better pastor, and so on and so forth. You see that? That's where the problem is today. It's only when the father can establish the preeminency, the centrality, the place of who Jesus truly is in that house, then everything in the house fall into place. Our lives fall into place. Our wholeness our becoming, our change, our transformation, our manhood, our womanhood, our social engagement, our relationships, everything starts to fall in place only when the father recognizes that we're truly his house where his son has truly been restored to his rightful place. Can we understand that? So he says here that him... Let him have his way, keep in perfect union with him. So he says, the vicarious life of your Lord is to become your vital, sinful life. The way he worked and lived among men must be the way he lives in you. That's wonderful, isn't it? So this is This is the Lord's desire for us.
So may the Lord communicate this into our hearts in our times. This house, if that can only become at the heart uh, of, our, of, of, the, of everything that is in us, the whole, the whole presiding reality, the controlling, if I may use the word, the whole preeminence, the whole controlling reality of our lives is the affairs of God's house. Do we live like this? Do we live in that consciousness that everything that is in us at the center of it is that because we are the father's house. So if it is the father's house, then the father has good business with his own house. And his son is at the center of that business. <laughs> and once we understand this, can you imagine saying that uh, the rest that enters into our hearts the rest that enters into our heart and that how peaceful, how secure, how assured our hearts will be. All right. And that becomes a transcending reality. It brings a transcending sense. So we don't have to live our lives scrambling. Every other, every other little issues in our life, you know, bring so much of anxiety, so much of worry, so much of distraction. And, uh, where does it all come from? It comes from this. It's the lack of this. It's the lack of understanding that we are that house. And that has to be an increasing reality in us. Let me say this here to you. All right. And uh, I, not, none of us here, not even myself, can communicate this reality to you until the spirit of the Lord bring this into your heart. Do you know that whole statement by Chambers? This, this is... This, this is almost as if that, uh, uh, how many of you understand this? Look, look, at the, look at the wisdom, look at the way in which Chambers brought this. This is about 100 old years ago, this man wrote this. That it is not you that have to go through them. It is because of the relation into which the Son of God has come in his Father's providence in your particular sainthood. Look at the wisdom. This is what I'm talking about. Look at the ability to state something like this. And it can only come out from a man who has understood the ways of the Lord. And this is tremendous wisdom. This is the wisdom of eternal life. This is the ways of the Lord understood by a man who has given so much of his life having to drink from this life. Who, who, which person? You, you can't get this kind of a knowledge from a university, from education. You don't, you, don't, you don't understand this just because, you know, you have got degrees behind your name, because you are, you know, you are, you are an expert in, 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 in the fields of experiences of life or whatever. You can't say it. This come from someone who had drank deep, who have stayed in the father's house, who have become such a son in the understanding of the father's business in the father's house, was pay attention to the father's son, which is Jesus himself, to the point that he sees everything now about his natural circumstances. To be employed by the Lord and in the Lord's providence to use by the Lord only for one purpose. It all relates to the increase of Jesus Christ in his life. It matters nothing to him. It matters nothing to him as long as he serves the father's business. It matters nothing to him, however my circumstances of my life turn out to be, as long as he serves the father's business, because I am the father's house, and at the center of his house lives his very son in my life. And if that becomes the all-consuming, the all-holding reality of your life, and that's exactly where we are. That's where our stability. That's where our. Uh, that's where our uh, our peace is. <laughs> All right. So, praise God for that wisdom. Uh, 
so long ago shared with the church. And we are supposed to know this in our lives. All right? And so this is what is so lacking today here. What is lacking is, for all of us, is the ability to discern, to understand the ways of the Lord in our lives. So that we wouldn't have to, every five minutes and every other day, uh, be given so easily, you know, to anxiety, to worry, to complaints, to so much of the negativity, so much of the depression, um, and, and so much of the, the dumbfoundedness that we find ourselves in. We lack the stability, we lack the peace, we, we lack, you know, the constancy of an untroubled spirit. Why is it not exhibited? And we can't exhibit. This is because we're so restless, because we're all over the place. We're so troubled. You know, every, every event in our lives, we don't see this as from this premise that we are at the center, that, this, that my life is the Father's house in which he has, he has invested the very life of his own son through redemption, through the death and resurrection of his own son, put within me the whole business, the whole business of his own son in my life. And he's ordering providentially. I have now become his house of which he's ordering that house to be formed and shaped as he desires. And he's, and he's, and his sole interest is what that son become in me. Because if I am that house, he's only interested in one thing in that building and in that house, is how his son grows in me. It's how his son has been constructed in me and how his son has been formed in me. Now, if that is not the overriding reality in our lives, guess what? Guess how are you going to live? How am I going to interpret everything about our lives? If it is not that we'll be centered upon ourselves. So you become the center. So it's about you, me. I, I become the center. Why am I so worried? Why this happened to me and that happened to me? Got it? See that? And uh, so, 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 you, so, so we will not be taken over. Uh, now I'm sharing this here with you is because, uh, you know, was it today is Sunday? On Tuesday, you know, on on, on Tuesday, uh, I went out to do some chores. But glad is actually, and uh, it's just it's so just basic chores. But the chores that kind of like uh, we went to this shopping mall that we're supposed to have something done, and we've not been there because of the of the situation, the MCOs and everything, the COVID. So we've not get, been to that place, but because both of us have been vaccinated. And uh, so we felt a bit safe now with the two doses. So we went in to do some work. So I've not been at that mall for the last, what, at least for the last two, three months. So we parked and then she went ahead and I was getting ready to come out and we walked. Can you imagine? I was walking at the entrance of this mall. There was a little cup. Uh, I walked through that mall, you know, months before and so long ago. But it has to be this time after about two, three months not, not, not entering into this mall. You know, as I was stepping into the curb, can you imagine? It was a small little curb that I missed. And there was, I placed my feet on it and there was a misstep and that was it. And uh, I had a cracking sound. I fell. I was on the floor and uh, there was a paying ticket boot where there was a queue, people lining up and they saw me fell. I was like a lump, I was like a lump of flesh bang right there on the floor and i heard a cracking sound on my feet on my left feet and i knew uh i knew it was bad so i injured my feet it was a bad sprain and in less than three minutes i was going up the elevator i couldn't even walk anymore i was holding on to the railing uh, gladys was trying to hold on to me i said don't touch me because i was in i was in excruciating pain I managed to just limp through quickly, do what I did, and I came home. My goodness, it was, I mean, it, it, it went up, the whole thing. And uh, it started, I think it was internal bleeding. I tore the ligament. And so I'm still walking with a limp. 
And uh, so, <laughs> and then the next day, my granddaughter Jana came. So can you imagine or not? I'm going to run, a house, run, 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 run around the house with my, with, my, with my legs all bandaged up and having to look at her and she, having to make sure that she avoid having to touch my leg. So anyway, uh, just to let you know that, uh, so my whole night I was in pain, you know, I, I, it, was, it was terrible. It was, the, the pain was, was, was excruciating. So I must have tore the whole leg went black and red. And I tore, I, so I'm still waiting for the doctor's appointment by tomorrow to have an X-ray or MRI taken, whether how bad is the tear of the ligament or whether I broke any bones in my, in my, in my, in my, in my anchor. What I'm saying here is that, you know, so that took a day, some hours later, but that, that's not going to cause me to stop drinking. Or asking all kinds of questions and why all this has happened. And so what I'm saying here to you is that the light of the sun stay the course, hold you like an anchor within your heart and bring you back into the focal point of person of Jesus Christ. It brings you back into that peace. It brings you back into that state that your, your, whole, your emotions, your mind, your thoughts is not all over the place. Yes, there's a pain. Yes, there's discomfort. Yes, there's a ludicrous, you know, falling, you know, and, uh, and all of this that can happen to you, you know, I'm not, I'm not into, you know, any of these distress or anxiety of any kind, I came home, I rested and life went back to normal and I'm able to function and do my things again, though with the limb and the aches and, stuff and things like that. So what I'm saying here is this, where is it? Where, what, what's holding you? What is, what is, can I say, though you are unconscious and yet consciously what is it that is holding you? Yeah, you're not conscious of it, but what is? Though it is unconscious holding you in a way for me is become consciousness, the peace, the joy, the rest, the untroubled rest that settles in you, that holds you in a good state and puts you in the place of abiding because you know that everything about your life even if may be an accident, it may be something that has happened out of the blue that shocked you or surprised you. What do you think? You think this is all a mishap? You think that all of this is misfortune? All of this all has to do with the enemies attacking you? Well, perhaps, but you know what? Nothing's going to take the peace away in your heart because you know you are the Father's house. And at the center of that house, is the life of his own son, which is his ultimate business. So it's not about you in your fall. It's not about you having sprained your ankle. It's not about you losing that job. It's not about you having to go through that tiff in your marriage. It's not just about you. It's not you. And if you can understand that, I suppose that will give you the strength and the peace to walk through whatever that you're suffering and walk through whatever is, you know, your sprain or whatever that you are now going through in your marriage or whatever you're going through with your children. And God will give you the wisdom. And God will give you the strength. And God will give you the clarity, the interpretation. So I'm able to sit in front of you and be able to share things like this with you is because that's, that's exactly what should be all of our testimony, all of our stories that I am the Father's house. And at the center of the Father's house is his business. And there's only one business God is conducting. It's the business of the reality of Jesus Christ in my life. What has he become in us? Ever since the child has been born in us, what has he become? What has he become? What has the life of the child of God in us become? Has it become a pleasure to the Father? Has it brought pleasure and joy to the Father? Has the growth of the Son in me brought glory to the Father? Has the growth of the Son of God in me brought such pleasure and pleasing to the Father? 
That's the question for all of us. So Lord, we're thankful in such a time like this. We thank you that your business is unchanging because your son is unchanging. There's only one business you care about in your own house. And that house happens to be that you have made us in our humanity, in our manhood, in our womanhood, to be, a, to be the very dwelling place of the life of your own son. Thank you so much. So Lord, only you can tell the state of your own house, our house, myself, our lives. What is the state of our house? Has it been properly renovated? Has it been truly built? Has it truly been formed and shaped, Lord, and cut and shaped and built in a way that the mind of the architect, the mind of the father be realized? Thank you again. Lord, bring this to us because it has everything to do, do with what we become in our manhood, what we become in our womanhood, what we become as men. Because in the measure in which, Lord, we will care about your business and your house. And to that measure, you will care about us. To the measure that we will respond to the life of your son. To that measure, Lord, you will respond to our wholeness. You will come to bring us into our wholeness, our healing, our formation, the conforming into your image, our changes, our transformation, everything about our lives. You do care because you care about the birds that flies above us. You care about the hairs that is being numbered on our heads. You care about the lilies of the valleys. Why would you not care about us? But your care in us is only measured by how much we allow you indeed to be in us, your house, where your son lives. And what your son has become in us has everything to do with what we in ourselves would become in you. So thank you again, Lord. Put this in our hearts. And, uh, and so much needs to be explored in this. Oh, God, such a wisdom. Thank you again. So long ago for an Oswald chamber, you put in the deserts of Egypt, in the dire circumstance, and all of the death that surrounded him. My God, and yet you raise a life, you raise a man who understood such fine working and such understanding because, Lord, he himself was an example of that house of which your son lives in. And perhaps that's the reason why after hundred over years, out of that river comes so much that the church is still drinking from him. So thank you again. So, Lord, continue to minister to us. We give you praise, and as each one of us in different countries represented here, go through our challenges and circumstances for our lives and our families and or behaving with loved ones. My God, we ask of you, once again, may you find in all of us your house that you take joy in, your house that you take pleasure in, your house that you can finally come and say, what a business I have conducted. What business have I truly conducted in my own house? in that man, in that woman. Thank you. We give you praise for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Adrian, for putting up. No problem. That's your pleasure. Before we close today, um, let's just take some time to respond to the word that was given. If you have a prayer in your heart or something you would like to share, please do so at this point. Father, we give you thanks again for your word, for your grace, for your love. Thank you that you indeed have provided the river, the eternal river from the beginning and have it there until the very end. That all of us needs to come into it, be in a continual diving into the river 
flowing with the river and allowing the river to take us and become the very living water that comes forth from our life that we can indeed be a blessing to many. And it is actually the river of life, the very life of the sun and God that be truly become in us. And then an outflowing of it to become the blessing and a ministry to many. That is what you so intended for your people, for your church. Thank you again. We, we know some of it, and yet we do not know the depth of it. We agree with it a lot of time with all that have been said and what has been given in your word. But Lord, make it a reality and indeed make it an abiding reality that we prove we, that we, our, our life, our character, our being, is continuing, continuingly becoming the a very house of God that you could live in. Not something that we have in our head, but Lord, something that is so real in our being. And we know, Lord, that we need to come in a continual repentance that. We are so unworthy of it. Imagine that this body is now the house of God, that the Son of God lived in. We are indeed so unworthy of, of all of this, but we know, Lord, that we have looked beyond this. It is truly the life of the Son in us that you looked upon. To cause us to cause this to sing deep in us, O oh Lord, that the union of God and me is now become the, a reality, and the governance of God is the one that takes priority. It is not me, it is not who I am, it is not what I do, it is what God has become and what God, God has done. So Lord, make that a thirst and a hunger in me and in all of us. Cause us, O oh Lord, to, to take this word not lightly, a lot that it is not just a conviction, but Lord, take it beyond because it, it cannot be a conviction today and then it goes away another day. We come before you humbly this day, O oh Lord, to say that if we continue to leave the way we used to, there will be, we will be overwhelmed by things of the world. We know it, and yet, oh Lord, that we are still fighting to sustain. And so, Lord, help us to come to our end, and that we know that no matter how we fight to sustain and we keep depending on our own strength. Lord, it will be to it will be to no good benefit, and we will we will reach a point that we will totally destroy ourselves and even others, cause us to see beyond even ourselves. Sometimes we we think that it is just ourselves, but it is beyond. The destruction is not just what we do that costs to ourselves, but also to to lives to people around us, and even to our own nation. We see our country today falling apart. So Lord, help us. 
come, we pray that we could see this and not take this lightly. Thank you again. Indeed, at the same time, it is good. It is great encouragement to know that you give us such a word to prepare us for the worst that has yet to come. So what, O oh Lord, if it is truly you who now rules and lift amongst us, may we submit it all to you and allow you to walk us through the tribulation that has yet to come, if it has not come, the sufferings and the pain that we have to go through. And yet, Lord, that our eyes be always stayed on you, our heart be single, and that it is about who you are. It is about your son who has rose victorious in all of our lives through the sufferings, through the tribulation and pain. So, Lord, thank you again. Be exalted this day because of who your son is, because that his life has been victorious in one, in two, and the many to come. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your saints. Thank you for your pastors and leaders who have been drinking from the river. Thank you for people, the saints like Oswald Chambers, who has dug so deep a well that so many now can drink from it. We bless you and thank you in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father.
Mom, you are muted. You have to unmute yourself. Sorry. Thank you, Lord, for your indwelling spirit that you will not leave us high and dry, that you will come with your presence. As the psalmist says, as a beer spent for the water, so our soul longs for you in this dry and thirsty land, in this land that is laden with wickedness and evilness, our soul cry out to you. Come and feel us. And as Sami say, don't pass us by. Do not pass us by. Let your presence sweep us, Lord, in your comfort. And in knowing that you will not desert and abandon your church, which is your body. And in fact, John says, let you increase and we decrease. Literally, that what it meant, Lord, that you will come and fill up yourself in this temple, in this holy temple which you have created, that we will not despise, Lord, that what you have given to us in good times and in bad times. We let our thoughts dwell on you for whatever it is, Lord, that we will not be like Joe's wife that will say, curse you because of what has befell on us. Let Lord our mouth be full of praise and Lord that you grace us and you will grant us that it is not by might, it's not by power, indeed by your spirit. In this we are thankful Lord, we know that we are not alone and that you have not abandoned us nor deserted us but to your spirit Lord you continue to do a deeper work in us that we will come closer and closer Dearer and dearer, Lord, that our life and our living will be a glory unto your name and a hope in all the undertakings that you have allowed us to go through. In this, we give you thanks, Lord. You will never leave us nor forsake us. That is our prayer that your church will draw closer to you. Indeed, to you, not to the ministry, not to the do doings and the workings, Lord, that we will work out our salvation with fear and in deep trembling. Thank you. In Jesus' name, we give thanks. Amen. Or oh, indeed, we live in a day and age where so much is at our fingertips. We are spoiled a lot with choices, spoiled with options, spoiled with customizations that we have even taken it into the church. We've taken it into your word where we are now, Lord, so self-centered, so self-consumed, so self-aware that we want church the way we want it. We want things the way we want it. Uh, we want church to have a certain way of worship. We want pastors to preach a certain message, to preach a certain gospel that suits our needs, that fits our wants and our desires. But Lord, we thank you that regardless of who we are, regardless of what we are, your word stands true. That indeed, heaven and earth will fade, but your word will still remain. So we thank you, Lord, that the reminder, once again, is, is this, that it's not about us. It never has been and it never will be. That you came, Lord Jesus, to fulfill the Father's will. There was no sentiment for mankind. There was no 
sentiment, Lord, that you were being a hero or you were being a martyr. You came only to do the Father's will because that was all that mattered to you. The will of the Father, the heart of the Father. That was your preeminent consideration. That was your preeminent concern. And now, Lord Jesus, you have invited us, your church, to live in the same disposition, to come into the same reality where it's not about us. So teach us that humility, teach us to yield and surrender and to know, Lord, that in the scheme of things, in the great cosmic saga that is to be played out, we are but your servants. We are but, Lord, your church that have been chosen to play a role and to play a part in what is to come. So we thank you, Lord, that this is what you have given to us. And you chose us not because we were worthy, but because you did your work on that cross and thus counted us worthy. So let us live every day with that mindset, with that consideration, God, that nothing in us is worth saving. Nothing in us is worth your grace. You did not save us because we were worthy. You did not save us because we deserved it. You gave to us your life. You gave to us your love because that is who you are. Because God, you are God. And Jesus, you did that work on the cross for the Father's will, for the Father's pleasure. So we are thankful, Father, for this word once again. We're thankful for the work that you have done on the cross of which we are all beneficiaries. So help us to live circumspectly, to live knowing, God, that there is nothing in us worth saving. Only what you do in us is worth saving. Only what you live, how you, what, what, what life you impart into us, the life that you live within us, that is what you are coming to save. So we are thankful, Lord Jesus. Thankful for your love. Thankful for your grace. And Lord, we live in that thankfulness. We live in that gratefulness every day of our lives every single moment, every single time, even when we go through the ups and downs of life, help us to stay in that source, help us to drink from that river, help us to drink from that source that never runs dry, to know, Lord, that this is where we are to abide every day of our lives, that, Lord, we, we do not come into your presence only on a Sunday and we leave on a Sunday, we remain in your presence constantly, we remain in your presence every single day, every single moment, so even as we depart this place, as we go about our day, as we go about whatever it is that we need to do. Lord, help us to be mindful of where we are living in. Help us to be mindful of our place. Help us to be mindful of where we are in regards to the source, that we are to stay close to you, that we are to be in this ever-abiding presence. So Lord, be with us all in our challenges, in our difficulties, in whatever we are facing in life. Lord, be with us. Be with Chin. Praying that his foot will continue to recover. And we pray, Lord, that even as he goes for his check tomorrow, that there will be no severe ligament damage we pray that things will be at a minimum and that you will be able to recover and walk soon uh, be with silas as well we continue to remember my brother before you in prayer lord we just pray that um, this covid situation that he has taken lord we pray that you'll be with him we pray that his recovery will be swift and even as he quarantines himself lord jesus he heal his body but more than that minister to his spirit encourage him comfort him in this time that he's in and be with his friends and the people that has come into contact with him as well. We pray, Lord, that everyone will, re will recover smoothly, that they will be able to go back to their studies and their work. So be with Silas even at this time. Um, be with Prabhashini as well, and the boys continue to keep your hands upon them, sustain them, uphold them, and continue to encourage them in all that they are going through in this moment. And we continue to remember Ruan as well, praying that, Lord, he will come into a knowledge of who you are as well in the days to come. So we thank you for this Sabbath day, for this Sabbath morning. We pray, Lord, that your presence will continue to abide within us as we continue to ruminate on your word, as we continue to share and talk to our spouses and our families of what you have said. Lord, give us your word, give us your spirit, and give us your life. So we ask and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Christy, there was something you wanted to share, isn't it, Christy?